Single family homes in Calgary Northwest have declined by $24,000 in one month. What is the real answer to the Canadian housing affordability crisis? That's what we are going to cover today in the Keys of the Castle podcast, hosted by myself, Adam Fife, and my best mate here, Andrew Stengler. How are you, Andrew? I'm excellent. I'm uh, I'm ready to dive into this. Um, I think we've done quite a bit of research, but uh, it's something that is center of mind, and we haven't really heard any real answers to it. So mm-hmm. what is the real answer to the Canadian housing affordability crisis? Is there a crisis? Um, I think that we've distinguished there's a, there's a crisis for some, and there's a crisis in some areas. Um, however, we haven't really heard any answers to make housing more affordable. I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, what would you call it? What did you call it? You call it repainting. There's been a lot of- uh, Repackaging. Repackaging. Repackaging of certain federal policies, which look good, but when you start to dive into them, they don't fully make sense. Or they've been in, in circulation for quite some time, and now they're just resurfacing as something a little different. So in this episode, we're going to talk about some of the things that we've come up with over the last couple of weeks of what we feel could be the real answer to the Canadian affordability affordability housing crisis. So I'm going to start off with here. We'll, we'll fly over the topics here just so you know what's coming, okay. and then uh, and then we'll dive into the first one. So like today we're going to be talking about 40-year amortization. Is it really as risky as people think? Um, some tax solutions possibly with RSP uh, contribution room or otherwise, uh, removing GST altogether for new construction or and or subsidies for new construction production uh, in Canada. And then lastly, we're going to kind of be uh, having a debate between two options, either uh, slating certain areas within municipalities for higher urban density or creating a, a push to external uh, municipalities uh, to create create more urban spaces that are still connected to larger cities, as we've seen mostly on, say, in Vancouver and mm-hmm. Toronto, and and mirror this in, in other locations that are likely more affordable. Uh, so let's start off with the uh, four-year amortization. You, you had an interesting take before the podcast, so maybe let's start there. Um, interesting take before the podcast. I mean, we talked about a lot before the podcast. Yeah, we- so that, that was, <laughs> uh, 40-year AMs. I mean, 40-year AMs for me, I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, I don't really think that that is the the be-all, end-all for uh, the affordability crisis. And the, and the reason is, in my opinion, is yes, you have lower monthly um uh, what would you call that? Lower monthly payments and stuff like this, but you're paying a hell of a lot more interest. And um, at least in my personal view, I would rather pay more principal per month and have it paid down quicker yep. um, to hopefully leverage that for more assets rather than dragging that out for long periods of time. But you have a little bit of a different view on that. Yeah, I mean, I would I would disagree. So for those that... Um... I don't know what we're talking about, 40-year AMs. We're talking about 40-year amortization. So with mortgages in Canada, currently uh, banks are aiming for a 25-year amortization. Mm-hmm. They could go up to 30. There are some exceptions with variable mortgages or um, what are those flex mortgages called that are a mixture between fixed and variable? Just a mixed mortgage is what I call them. Mixed mortgage. Yeah. Uh, that are, are proceeding. So their interest rate or their interest payment could almost make up the entirety of the payment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's happened since... They locked in at like 1.9 up until 7% right now. So there are some exceptions, but generally uh, applying for a 40-year uh, mortgage on a residential property is no longer allowed. Mm-hmm. It was allowed in Canada. Uh, it was allowed up until 2008. So uh, in 2007, ING um, Direct Canada was the first uh, domestic lender to actually uh, pull the plug on the program post-2008, and they just found that it was a little bit too risky with what was happening in the States. So I, I think I think there's an answer there though, and I think it's it's all around what you, you can afford. Mm-hmm. So right now, if you can't get yourself into a house or you're not getting pre-approved, it it is a simple conversation around the month-to-month payments. Mm-hmm. Your mortgage broker is going to seek your income, and they're going to take your month-to-month payment and see if you can actually uh, afford the property. However, with 40-year AMS, um, it's it's a solution to bring the overall monthly payment down. But you are right; your interest payment is going to be a massive portion and you're going to be putting little towards principal. Mm -hmm. However, it might be the conversation between renting and owning. This is true. So we're hearing some pretty scary conversations in Calgary even, uh, which we haven't in the past of people that have rented for five, six years and their, um, their landlord now found out that they can make a thousand dollars more a month off their, off their rent. 
And so they're having to find a place to live. They can't afford a mortgage for themselves. Now rental rates are way higher than what they got in. This way they lock into a place that they actually own. And as long as they make their mortgage payments, this this could be their property forever. I'd also make the argument that over if they're going to live there long term, 15, 20 years, if we look in the past 15 to 20 years, a, a majority of what their house is worth now was not made in sweat equity, but rather appreciation. That's correct. So it gets them into the investment, but you're not making long term um, principal payments. And that kind of leads us into the next. And we'll, we'll circle around the next topic as is a pairing to this 40 year amortization, which is possibly a tax solution. So I was thinking maybe an RSP contribution, which you can contribute on uh, on a term basis. So in Canada, you can set terms in your mortgage, unlike the states, uh, not set, but they are set. Um, one year, three years, two years, five years. But when that term is up, you reset your mortgage to whatever the interest rate is at that given time. And so what we were spitballing is possibly a tax-free shelter uh, that would allow that money to be invested. So you're paying, let's say, $1,000 a month towards your house at a 40-year AM, but it might have been $1,700 a month um, under a 30-year AM, right? And so that extra $700 a month can be put into a tax-free shelter, kind of like an RRSP where you're not paying taxes on the actual balance. You're allowed to invest it back into the key economy in the interim. And then you can pull it out at the end of your term and place it into principal in your house or keep it there as a retirement saving. And so I, th- I think this ties pretty well with our last podcast that I'm, I'm unsure if a long-term strategy for the next 50 years so for our demographic looking to when we retire, if owning a, a single family house in which you live in is actually a feasible retirement plan, and then taking all that money out of retirement and then figuring out how to live for the next you know, 15, 20 years, right? which is what we're seeing right now. People that have purchased single family detached, it's gone way up in value. They're selling it to the next generation, they're cashing out, and then they find a place to rent or they go to Mexico or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever their game plan is. But it's like seventy percent. We we read the stats last time. Um, it, it's like seventy percent of the uh, Canadians' net worth is tied up into their single family yeah. detached. When surveyed, over fifty percent of retirees uh, found that a over half of their retirement savings is going to come out of their single family house mm-hmm. when they sell it. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. Uh, obviously, we don't have a pension plans to to support mass retirement, right? Uh, so this would be the answer for that. But this would be another solution. So you're saying that the forty year AM will help kind of push people away from having that retirement savings plan of using the equity in their house because they're not building that much equity up in that house as fast as you can? I think I think it should be an option of choice. But if if your plan is to build full equity in your house, mm-hmm. power to you, yep. right? You don't want a mortgage, you should do that. Mm-hmm. But should it be through a forced 25-year amortization, 20-year amortization mm-hmm. house where you, a majority of your household income is going towards that house itself right. or could we lower that monthly payment and have the ability to contribute it to your RSP or otherwise. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the States, th- their household spending towards their housing generally is much lower than Canada. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're spending it elsewhere in the economy. They're spending it at Walmart. They're investing in the stock market. They're doing whatever, buying trucks or whatever, right? But if you're on this shoestring, every household has a thousand bucks a month that they're not spending on their basic necessities, mm-hmm. their their shelter, you know, the utilities of their house. That's we we have this this stagnant economy where so much money is accredited within the house itself mm-hmm. that there's very little to spend on other other things. Right. Right. Um, so we kind of reach a stalemate, and I think this loosens up a lot of the the uh, the spending ability within the the general Canadian economy. But in the interim, it's going to get um, individuals into uh, their primary house. So just to be clear, the proposal was forty year amortization only for primary households. Now there's going to be some abuse to that, but I, I think that the abuse is going to um, really shadow mm-hmm. uh, in, in comparison to the people that utilize this program for what it really should be. Mm. I I like your point. I think that you've got a pretty good, um, like the, you've got some pretty good points there, like an, for argument's sake. I I guess I'm more or less in, I'm, I'm, it's kind of funny because maybe I am the problem because at the end of the day, I want to pay that equity down, right? And I think that majority of Canadians should pay that equity down because now they're kind of a slave to the system where they're just paying all this interest. 
And especially if in, if if the home prices do fall and they haven't paid down that much equity in the five to 10 years of the first 40 years of the amortization, I think more people are going to be screwed because they haven't paid down the equity fast enough. They've just relied on the interest rates. Interest rates have gone up an astronomical amount. You have not paid your uh, equity down in the first three years. 2025 is around the corner. Interest rates are now up to 6%. You're going to be even more screwed because now your interest is not only doubled, if not tripled for some people who got the 2% interest rate, but is tripled on a principle that has not gone down at all. So, I mean, I think you're setting people up for more failure than not, than by then forcing them to pay it down faster. That's just my, that's the way that I'm thinking at least. And I could, I could have that wrong, yeah. but I think that there needs to be limitations, right? Like I agree the 40 year AM does make sense in certain scenarios. And I think that there are people that could greatly benefit from that, but there has to be some fail safes and protections because even the government of Canada was like, or uh, sorry, the Bank of Canada was saying, oh, interest rates are going to be down for a very long time. Spend, spend, spend. People spend, spend, spend. Mm-hmm. And now look at it. It's up to 6% for some people and there's going to be a lot of defaults. And the people that have 40-year AMs are going to default more likely than the other people that have 25-year. Why? Because their equity is not paid down nearly as fast. Because now their their interest rate, so I, I, I would have to do the math, but I mean, if over the first five years you pay down, let's just say, I don't know, $20,000 worth of equity, just rough numbers, where someone on a 40-year AM only paid down 6000 or 8000 right? Yeah. Under half. Now, with the interest rates increasing, they've increased more on the uh, principal amount that has not gone down nearly as much. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, potentially, I, I, don't, I don't think the, the single-family house is also the largest liability that mm-hmm. any, any family owns. So, so fair. Yeah, I, I've heard the argument, 40-year amortization, you're no longer renting, you're just renting from the bank, yeah. right? Who's a fairer landlord? Mm-hmm. I mean, the jury's still out with that. However, yeah, okay, so interest rates increase. So, you know, in, in the example that I held that your mortgage payment's $1,000 a month and you would be uh, you would be uh, spending 1700 under a different amortization period mm-hmm. if you've made the tax-free contributions. If you made the cap, yes. If, if you, you made it, you're yeah. going to be in the exact same spot. It, it, actually, you're going to be in a better spot because you're you're contributing the seven hundred dollars a month to a tax free shelter, yep. meaning you're not being taxed. That's an if though. That so you'd have to put the forty year AM and the RSP in one package because a lot of people won't do that. So it's going to be a force. I don't think it should be forced. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it is. It's going to get them into houses now. Mm-hmm. It's going to save our problem right now. Which if home prices fell, their term. Yeah. If if houses fell then our retirement program that we're running right now is almost our biggest pension fund program, which is selling your single family detached house. Mm-hmm. Prices fall, those people lose like 25% of their retirement savings. Mm-hmm. It's just going to ultimately fall on the general population right now. Absolutely. Away. So, yeah, I what? get it. I, I personally, I'm always going to sit around 20 or 80% loan to value on my house. Yeah. I think having it tied up in the house is just foolish. It should yeah. be invested elsewhere. Absolutely. And I think the ability to do so should be should be left in, out in the open rather mm-hmm. than someone forced to pay. Because essentially, you're just running onto a treadmill mm-hmm. of housing, mm-hmm. right? You, you're going to take down a house. You're going to contribute. A, a, I mean, the CMHC is claiming that over half or a majority of Canadians goes towards their housing. See, so you, you work you work a ton over half of your gross pre-tax income mm-hmm. is going towards just your basic necessities. Right. And then you just grind that treadmill down until you hit 40 and then you got full principal in your house. Now you can sell the house, assuming that housing values went up and now assuming that people can afford them, mm-hmm. right? Like it's this whole circular knowledge. So in an ideal, yeah, in an ideal world, you want a full principal in your house, power to you. Mm-hmm. Um, however, it doesn't get people into housing now. Mm-hmm. So is it setting them up right. for failure in the future? I think they should have the tools to make the decision for themselves. Absolutely. But is it failure in the future? Or is it the inability to do anything at all? And I'd say that this way, making small principal payments and having a fixed location where they can live is more beneficial right now mm-hmm. than just saying you can't afford it because we've tried, we thought through this idea, mm-hmm. and there's this chance that it just might fail in like 10 years. Right. So I think that this is a, obviously a hot topic for us. And I think that this, I, I'm actually excited to to bring this up again in the future after we have more time to do the research. But why don't we move on to an immediate fix that I feel could make a serious difference in all of Canada. And I think you we can agree on this one. 
where removal of the 5% GST on all new construction. And in Ontario, it's even worse. And I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Ontarians pay 13% HST on all new construction. If they want to bring down affordability, they need to up the supply of housing and they need to make that supply affordable. And in order to do that, our government should consider not a rebate, but a removal of that tax because that will have an instant effect on affordability here in Canada. What are your thoughts? I, th I think it's a mixture of 5% in Ontario. It's 5% GST, 7% HST, just, okay. just pure HST. Okay. I don't know if that's important to clarify, but... Probably. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think another thing to be clear about is that if you're a good builder, and I mean, we've, we've covered this, I think, in a past podcast, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to publish it, but if you're a good builder, you're not actually paying tax. You're, right. You're not. You're offloading it to the end user. You're claiming ITCs all the way through the project. End user is paying 5 to 13% tax, depending on which province you're going to be putting in. But that's absolutely insane that we even would have that program in place that on when we need housing this bad the federal government and the provincial obviously depending on what province you're in if there's a provincial tax applied um you're going to pay five to thirteen percent tax in addition mm -hmm. to what you're already paying on that property you now which is increased drastically yeah i i think a rebate program is where the government would ultimately go first of all but if we we just had a discussion before the podcast that uh, a failing program in Canada and something that I just is just a money sucker is uh, the GST rebate on farmers. Yeah. Like they would save it. There, there was a, let's see if I can find the article and I'll publish it down below, but it's like something like $60 million a year is lost in the rebate program by just charging GST to farmers, them applying and then taking it back. So the agent well, fees, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. Administ the work on administration. Yeah. And then tons and tons of farmers don't even apply for the GST rebate. Mm -hmm. Smaller farmers especially because it is so much work to get it back. Mm -hmm. And so it's just the larger farmers that are going in for it. So just remove it. It's it's a leash. Yeah, yeah just remove it. Have a card that you bring, mm -hmm. similar to an ID or a health card. Mm -hmm. You bring it to a place. They write down the number. You send it in. Did, to a GST pay. I just can't see this government doing that, unfortunately. But I mean, that that would be an immediate effect. Like within a month, I'm pretty sure you would see some pretty big benefits. But then you go okay. back. Oh, how far? Like, you know, if you bought a house within the last 12 months, you're gonna get the rebate. Blah 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 blah. Like you're gonna you're gonna divide. The, the uh, I don't I don't I don't see it actually being as big of a deal. Um, honestly, I mean, if, if the five percent GST yeah. is going to be the huge tipping point, yeah. is it a massive amount of money? It's also the conversation as well. Our builders just going to put that into profits mm -hmm. and set the bench line higher, mm -hmm. potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, ultimately, removing the GST or taxes paid on new construction altogether mm -hmm. uh, is just fair. So whether it would work or not, it's just fair. Mm -hmm. None of that GST is putting being put back directly into new housing for everyone. That's valid. Okay, so what about, uh, this one was, I thought was an, an interesting one and it kind of talks on our last point about subsidized, um, subsidies for construction material production in Canada. So, I mean, we've got logging in BC. We cut down, we do a lot of forestry in BC. We do a lot of concrete work in Alberta and BC and we do a lot of metals in Ontario. Mm -hmm. How can we utilize those raw materials to help the affordability in Canada? Because to my understanding, all of those materials get processed in the USA and then we buy them back, right? Do I have that? Yeah, I, I don't know of all of them, but he, a, a good chunk of it. A wild amount goes. So we, we take the raw materials from Canada, it goes to the US, and then it's manufactured into whatever product you're going to be using, your hardboard right. siding, your trim. Now, some of it comes from Canada. Um, it just... It seems a little strange that we wouldn't subsidize, like we, we were on the news, we were talking about this earlier, we're subsidizing a portion of a, a Volkswagen uh, Volkswagen manufacturing plant in Ontario. Yes. Yeah, several millions of dollars going towards a wildly profitable company to just put a manufacturing plant there. Mm. Will it create tons of jobs? It doesn't look good on a political portfolio. I'm sure it does. Uh, but why wouldn't we not be subsidizing... Um, yeah, the, the manufacturing section mm -hmm. of creating... Absolutely. Uh, construction bring down materials. the cost of wood the cost of concrete yeah, like those would those two things alone would bring down the cost of wood and concrete Co or wood packages or framing packages fell i think two weeks ago mm -hmm. so we're in good shape but concrete three years to date is up over 50 percent yes it's, it's it's crazy and we've uh, got multiple um 
we've got multiple manufacturers here. Like Lafarge is huge, at least in Alberta. Mm. And there's so many people that are producing concrete here. Like, I don't know. It's a, it's a high level of thought. Um, yeah, I think of we're, just, we're throwing it out there. I, I would find that the 40 year AM is probably going to be the, the biggest impact that we've discussed so far. Um, but with, with a material shortage or an alleged material shortage, um, I, I think I would make it very clear that if we were to subsidize as in like, as a country, we were to subsidize these type of manufacturing plants, mm -hmm. it should be on a free market basis mm -hmm. that you're not saying, you know, we're selling at Hardy board at 20, $20 a sheet right now, for example, I don't actually know how much Hardy board costs right now, but let's say it's $20 a sheet. You got to sell it at 15 to do the subsidy. Mm -hmm. I, I think it should actually be a production threshold. So we, we flood the, uh, the material market. Mm. Yeah. I think that's so, um, conversation. We I, I would love to, I would actually like to dive into that more because I want to learn more about the processing. Like why, why are all like, why is most of the wood going? Like we do have mills here, but they're not nearly the size that they have in the USA. And a lot of things like from Ontario go out to the U S as well from the metals, the coppers, all that jazz. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I would like to look into that and I will agree that I don't know much yet. Oh, we get killed on lumber um, manufacturing mm -hmm. in, in Canada. It seems like every major uh, manufacturer and in even the, the logs that we do produce here, it seems like a good amount of it goes yep. to the US anyways. Mm -hmm. um, is it just their consumer demand down there so they can produce a larger at a, at a lower price because they're building more of it potentially? Um, but it's something I think we should refocus on in Canada, uh, the, the manufacturing of raw goods mm -hmm. uh, into materials. I think that's, yeah, that's a, that's a good conversation for the future. We've got two more here. Let's, let's kind of bust through them here. This one was a good one from you, Andrew. Um, you know, creating zones where federal lines of credit are available for higher density. Touch on that. I think that was an interesting point. I didn't even, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I wanted to pose this as, is a good way to finish the podcast is maybe a disagreement. And this is something that I think we, we, vastly disagree on so um my suggestion was to create to to, to preface this um, 80 percent of the roughly 80 percent of the canadian population lives in canada's major cities so there's not a 20 percent live in rural i think that's a given um we, people are urbanizing in canada at a higher rate than they ever have been and when they immigrate here they often go to urban spaces they're not choosing to go to rural spaces uh, at least not right away. So uh, what I proposed is looking at the 10 largest cities in Canada that people are both emigrating to, immigrating to, um, so emigrating, immigrating, and uh, and generally live there and, and are uh, born there. And then look at neighborhoods in those spaces that you can create higher density, where the federal government will offer, likely through CMHC, a line of credit at a much lower interest rate to create higher density spaces within uh, that neighborhood. So using an example like we had in uh, in Calgary, let's say West Hillhurst, right? It's a prime location. It's right across the, the river, right across from Memorial uh, and at quick access into downtown. Federal government's now worked with the municipality to slate that entire area for multifamily units. You can access a 2% line of credit to build multifamily up to a certain density, right? So rather than having a, uh, a maximum set of minimum, uh, density per building and you just access it and you buy land. So it'll be, it'll be gentrification, but I think it'll be fair gentrification because the values in that neighborhood will go wildly up. Uh, will that neighborhood look the same? Obviously not, but it'd be for the greater benefit of the city to have higher density in these key spaces. Alternatively, on the other side of the coin, you had a suggestion, uh, of manufactured cities. Well, it's more or less just incentivizing people to purchase homes just outside of the major cities. Now, I'm not disagreeing with your statement about the federal lines of credit. I think that's actually a good idea. Um, I just feel like the focus could be split instead of completely um, diverse or not diversifying, but uh, building high density in the major cities. But why not incentivize people to purchase houses outside the major cities? Like, again, using Calgary as an example. Could you imagine that we had direct rail to all satellite cities? So we're talking Chestermere, Okotoks, uh, Cochrane, and Airdrie, right? Those are affordable, a little bit more affordable than Calgary. Some satellite cities are an exception like Chestermere where it's a little bit more of a retirement community. But regardless, having people kind of spread out more. Now, not everyone wants to live in the middle of nowhere with no amenities. So you do need to also incentivize people by 
putting event centers, by making it more attractive for young couples, more work. Well, we talked about the Volkswagen manufacturer. Maybe you incentivize bigger corporations to have their businesses outside the city rather than everyone concentrating in the city. So instead of having these high density population centers where everything is just naturally expensive because everyone's there, having people kind of spread out a little bit and having a more land mass being utilized because Canada, we have, I don't know, I wouldn't know the percentage, but I mean, we're probably only really using like 5% of our land mass. We have so much land mm -hmm. in the country that could you imagine three major automotive plants were planted in Saskatchewan as an example. And then you also revitalize their city to have bigger artists come and join and people actually wanted to move to Saskatchewan, which would be a surprise. But at the same time, diversifying and trying to sh shove people away from the major cities to other places that what they could live an enjoyable life that's more affordable that was my thought but andrew doesn't seem to kind of agree with that in a way yeah i mean i i think it's the short term effects i mean assuming that um assuming that people would move to saskatchewan and then assuming that um they would enjoy Saskatchewan and not leave, right? Mm -hmm. I think before the podcast, I used the the example of New York during mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, mm -hmm. right? So we were talking about just overnight, if you were just to displace 500,000 people from Calgary and they were to disperse into either the greater Calgary area or into Saskatchewan or, or whatever satellite city for whatever purpose, right? Mm -hmm. What would happen to prices? Vacancy rates would be through the roof. Um, I mean, it would create a massive disturbance for sure. And mm -hmm. businesses would close and prices would fall for sure. But it was a year and a half. And then New York picked right back up where it left off. And the people who left are now trying to get back into the city. They're paying a higher value than what they sold at to get back into the spaces that they occupied prior to. I think it would just create a blip. Yeah, I don't think it would be a long lasting solution. And then in these spaces that we create, I don't think that they would remain affordable either. Mm -hmm. If you were to incentivize them with work and employment, which is likely what you'd have to do, um, you're, you're making higher wages in a space that things are inherently inexpensive. Everybody's got their hand in eventually, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, 500,000 Albertans moved to Saskatchewan making six figures a piece, right? And, and moved into a little town, house, house values are going to immediately start skyrocketing up right. due to lack of supply, unless they were all previously built, which would be a little bit, you know, futuristic. Um, or it was, it was subsidized housing from the corporation that actually put them there, I suppose. Um, but general spending in that community would go way, way, way up. Property taxes would go up. Totally. But at the same time, you're, you're, yes, that increases, but this decreases. Right. So the hope is that you're trying to level the playing field, right? Like you look at Toronto and you look at Vancouver and then obviously things start to decrease slowly as they get outside of those major cities. Mm -hmm. Then you got Calgary, things start to decrease as you, as you get outside of those major cities. So if you incentivize people to move to other places, yes, you hopefully, yes, there's lots of vacancies. You remove the demand, which drops all of the pricing, right? If there's no demand, obviously pricing has to drop. Mm -hmm. But people have to live in those places and enjoy them. Like your example with New York is everyone came back to New York. No shit, because New York is great. The places that they moved to probably didn't have the things to keep them there, right? Where if you actually incentivized enough people to move to those places, mm -hmm. especially early adopters that went there and purchased the product at cheaper rates, right? Mm -hmm. They have a little bit more incentive, uh, like in incentives to stay there. So I just thought it was a cool idea, right? Just to kind of help grow like Winnipeg or um, Brandon, Manitoba, like make these places more livable and more enjoyable. It's funny because I would imagine when you talk to some of the people that live there, they wouldn't want that because that's like their hometown. It's quiet. It's a lot quieter than Calgary and Toronto. And that's why they live there. But if we're trying to talk about affordability across the board, I would say you have to disperse the people and, and push them to go and live in other places. That makes sense. I think it's been established, though, that economies of scale within an urban space makes everything more affordable, mm. not less. So, I mean, New York's kind of an extreme example, but Vancouver, mm. much smaller population, price per square foot in the downtown core is competitive, if not exceeding New York, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a little upside down, and that's just like a, a lack of supply issue. Something like Calgary, where we don't have a ton of high density, this would be 
kind of a flip on how we're going to see the city. Calgary's always been this white picket fence. Everybody wants a house. Yeah, I agree. Consistent across Canada, but Calgary especially. Historically, we always had very high ownership rates, and everybody wants a house, (laughs) if not right away, eventually, right? And and I just don't see that as the future in five or 50 years. Mm Mm-hmm. Everyone, sh- the, the house should not be the desired destination, a place to live, right? So through higher density around the city, people are already here. People are already wanting to be here. People are here because it's affordable. Mm-hmm. How could we make it more affordable? Higher density units. I mean, it, if the downtown core right now is existing at like a 50% owner versus investor rate, why wouldn't we just flood that space? If not just to service the homeowners, but also to... Uh, lower rental values mm-hmm. through just forced um, increase in that in that mm-hmm. specific sphere. I guess in the in the, in the what am I trying to say here? She's just fitting more like, apart, more apartments. Yeah. We'll say a real simple more apartments, same amount of renters. Price take that down. Supply and demand. More choice. So you're you're looking at the supply factor, and I'm looking at the demand factor, right? So I mean, we I think we're both on the same page, but or sorry in the same book, but different chapters, right? Where I'm looking at removing the demand and you're looking at increasing the supply, right? And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. That's it. I think you have two scenarios though. Yeah. Using Calgary as the kind of guinea pig Mm -hmm. here, um, you displace through whatever type of incentive, assuming that people would actually go, Mm -hmm. you one, uh, either have a small blip or the demand to move to Calgary is high enough that people would replace the people that are moving right away. So it's basically a net neutral change Mm -hmm. in the city. Or it has such a dramatic dramatic effect on values that Calgary actually crashes mm-hmm. as people are displaced into this new location. Right, right. This place boosts in value, and there's going to be a rebound after an extreme crash within Calgary. I mm-hmm. think one of those two things would happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, if people moving to that set location were coming from a single city, assumably in this kind of like thought process. So I, 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 th- I, I think... Density is is a hundred year plan. Mm-hmm. I think displacement is a five to ten year plan. I would say okay, that's totally fair. I I, I hear your word, and it's funny because I would imagine that the that the the displacement would take five to ten years to even really see the effects of it because you're not going to build a automotive manufacturer or, or try to increase tourism in an area within a year, right? It's going to take a long time to try to build up brand in Manitoba. To make it attractive, so I mean, this is a long-term hundred-year plan. So, um, so it's a good hundred and fifty years trying to boost. I know, risk. but we're earning a lot now. Yeah, I to <laughs> see that. So, I think I think this is a good part for us to bring it back to the viewers out there who actually watched um, this segment. You know, what do you think it makes the most sense? Do you think that you know dispersing the supply? or sorry, dispersing the demand or increasing the supply. You know, let us know. Let us know who's right or who's wrong. At the end of the day, I think we both have valid points. So what are your... Yeah, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. So our suggestions to... uh, I think the real answer for Canadian housing is is in here somewhere, Mm -hmm. either in heart or in whole. Totally. Uh, But four-year amortization with possibly a paired tax-free shelter account. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, removing GST should have already been done yeah we're, we're taxing something that the the country dramatically needs mm-hmm. adding any extra cost with no incentive yeah. is foolish potentially subsidizing construction material production i'd love to see that it's probably a long-term effect i don't know if it's wildly as important as maybe we, we made it out to be um and then you know w- what are the two options between either creating higher density in cities i think this is gonna be an age-old conversation creating new cities or creating higher density within cities mm-hmm. themselves um, it's been circled around. Mm-hmm. Certainly not the first half of this conversation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I don't think anyone has the set answer thus far, though. So, Well, let's dive into it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we hope you found some value today. See you on the next one.